the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 27, Matthew 27, and uh, we've, 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 we've been following the Gospel of John mainly, but we're bringing in the extra passages, and of course we've been at the time of the crucifixion for some weeks, so we find ourselves still here. The Apostle Paul said, we preach Christ crucified. So it was a constant theme. It wasn't just something for once a year. It was continual. In fact, the introduction of, a, of an annual uh, event, as it were, maybe came a bit later. We're not quite sure. But ne nevertheless, we're here today and glad to be speaking on this enormous subject of the crucifixion of Christ and from Matthew 27, verse 45, and particularly verse 46. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. So we've considered some of the words of the Lord Jesus or the sayings of Christ on the cross, all of which are very brief, largely because of his immense suffering. He doesn't preach whole sermons, but he can say in a few words what we would take us forever to say even forever we won't be able to say it all uh, we saw him before perhaps when the nails were being put into him that he says father forgive them for they know not what they do then the gracious scene of the conversion of the thief on the cross promising him verily verily i say unto thee today shalt thou be with me in paradise and then with a few faithful friends around the cross and his mother Mary, he points Mary and John together and says, Behold thy son, behold thy mother. And so now, <coughs> those, those were all very gracious words. But we do much good. Jesus did much good while he was on the cross. It's amazing to think of those things. Having loved his own, he loved them unto the end, as we've seen, as we saw in John 13. But we need now to understand the meaning of the agony of the cross, the agony. Though Jesus Christ could be on the cross and proclaiming, uh, praying for forgiveness and to people to be in paradise and people being brought together into the family of God, yet he was suffering. There's no question of this. But the first thing that we note in verse 45 here, is there was darkness over all the land. From the sixth hour unto the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Now, we don't need to be too uh, concerned the exact timing of the sixth and the ninth hour. Precisely, we would like to be precise and say sixth hour was exactly midday and the ninth hour was exactly three o'clock. But when you compare the times given in the other accounts the uh, these periods refer to the whole quarter of a day so you refer to the third hour that's the beginning of the day the, si the sixth hour the middle of the day etc they're not necessarily precise times but we can see that here there's darkness upon the land from the middle of the day till the middle of the afternoon uh, three hours I, I i don't think these times are not always used in the exact minute they didn't have clocks uh, it's the, the, they're given to spread out the days now what do we make then of the darkness three hours of darkness on the cross well it's it's it was a miraculous thing to be dark in the middle of the day we know that it's the middle of the day and miracles in the Bible are signs. The word miracle in the Gospel of John means sign. It's the same. It's a sign. A miracle is a sign. It, they're not done just for the sake of it. 
they're not done just for the sake of healing or some feeding people they're signs and so what is this sign now it's it would be foolish to say that it was just an eclipse that happened by coincidence and if it was an eclipse and i don't I believe it was but if it was an eclipse then it was providential god had timed it that there should be darkness over the lord jesus christ in these last hours of his life and the question is, what does it mean? What does the darkness mean? And we see what the agony is, is, is about. The light of the world was being extinguished, as it were, by those who rejected him. That, that this was such an evil that it was the sort of thing that men would normally do in darkness. To, if you go around, we're told it was safe to walk in the daytime, Jesus said, men do their dirt darkness at night their, their their wickedness is carried out at night generally but this was in broad daylight crucified him in broad daylight jesus said for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved so they did they rejected jesus christ they didn't come to the light of him and they tried to extinguish his light in the middle of the day but it 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 would have been that they should have been afraid and they should have you would have thought this would have been done at night when evil was done they did it in broad daylight then god made it dark he made it a dark dark day frightening experience if you saw the eclipse some years ago i went it's down in Cornwall where there was some of the eclipse and it was an eerie feeling when it went dark in the middle of the day it was quite a pleasant day it was a bit cloudy it's a bit windy and then suddenly it, it didn't go completely black we weren't in the full and fullness of the eclipse but here we believe the darkness was like the darkness in egypt one of the plagues it terrified them and the people uh, by this miraculous sign should have alerted themselves to their guilty conscience that they were crucifying the lord jesus christ the darkness secondly um <clears throat> it, jesus was virtually naked he was bleeding intensely and it was something that you would want to cover up now he was crucified publicly and openly that is that is agreed but the shameful sight of christ dying was in a way for much of the time hidden from view there was some i'm not saying this was a sign of grace in the midst of this forsakenness but i noticed um some time ago people were doing a campaigns against abortion and they were putting up these pictures of babies or in in all their blood well the the bible speaks about covering the nakedness we should not uncover each other's nakedness we god's given us clothes since the garden of eden and we're to be clothed and there's something of the darkness even the darkness here to some extent clothing jesus christ so that maybe is a slightly obscure point it's certainly not the main point but it was a sign that they rejected him. They were not given to repentance. And the Bible warns us that we must act before the night comes. How suddenly darkness could come upon us. People are living in the light of day and suddenly the darkness strikes when it's just like a sign of a curse, of death. It will come, a day will come, we'll pass from life into death well the christians already passed from death to life but uh, it's a warning to us darkness may come and the the covering they're just the drawing off that from the covering of the nakedness of jesus Christ. it's a shameful thing but this is what the world is guilty of 
the killing of the Savior. And thirdly, the hour, the hour of the Prince of Darkness was has come. In Luke 22, 53, Jesus says, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Until the victory of the resurrection, it was to look as if the hour of darkness was upon the world. What a terrible hour it was. This is what life without God is, the darkness, the persecution of Jesus Christ, the forsaking of Jesus Christ, the leaving of him, the rejecting of him. And today the world without Christ is in darkness. And let us not, let us not hold back from standing firm in times, in such dark times. Jesus Christ was conquering on the cross, though, though covered in, in darkness of this world. The world had done its worst, but he was still and is still and would always be the glorious saviour. And his people, with all darkness of this world upon us, we are to be the light of the world, as Jesus says his people are, knowing that victory is assured in Jesus Christ. But fourthly, and the main thing, the plainest and the fullest explanation of the darkness is in these verses of God the Father forsaking his Son. From the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, that's the Hebrew translation uh, from Psalm 22, verse 1. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The darkness and the forsaking of the Father, forsaking the Son. The light is extinguished. The, the light of Jesus Christ shining in the world. And then darkness comes and he's forsaken and he's dying. Why has he been forsaken? The agony of Christ. These are not his last words, by the way. This cry is not merely a physical pain, but expressing the whole extent of his death, which is an offering for sin, an offering for sin. Now, this is what we need to understand of this forsaking, what it is to be an offering for sin. Christ is an offering, and he is the offering for sin. A sacrifice is completely given up. Think what a sacrifice is. If you're going to sacrifice something, you let it go completely. And a sacrifice in the temple or the tabernacle before, the animal is put to death. There is no sweet love holding the giver of the offering to the offering. He must part with the offering. He leaves him. He forsakes him. If a man has a sheep and he offers it as a sacrifice to God, he gives the sheep and he loses. The sheep is there to be slaughtered. It may have been a very lovely sheep. He may have loved the sheep. The shepherd may have treated it very well. But when the day comes to offer the sheep, then he must forsake it. It's gone. The sheep is going to the slaughter. How much more when Jesus Christ was crucified? The Father and the Son, God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, were not only close, they were one. There's a unity of the Trinity father of the son and the holy spirit and to think of the son without the love of the father being given as a sacrifice 
There is an eternal love within the Trinity from, from eternity to eternity. Never, never, ever been a moment like this. And although the <coughs> the crucifixion was was from eternity past, Christ is described as the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, from from when the purposes of of, the, of everything it was a, it's an eternal plan of God. Yet the Father and the Son were always perfectly together. But now darkness, the Son who is light is now in darkness he's never been in darkness and what we have here in the death of christ is the light of life being put out nothing other than god the father forsaking the son giving him over to this offering as i said the offerer the offerer gives the offering and they're separate and it's given what has happened to this is my son in whom i'm well pleased he now takes this different very different role and here as an offering the lord jesus is bearing the sins of his people bearing the sins of his people on the tree He's not on an altar, he's on a cross, which is, which is an altar. The sins of his people from all times past, present and future. Jesus Christ as the offering for sin is bearing it. This is the forsaking, the bearing of sin. He became sin for us. We might be made the righteousness of God in him. He knew no sin. Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He's made sin. He becomes the sin bearer. As, uh, Galatians chapter 3. We read, he became a curse for us. He became a curse. Cursed is those that are hung on a tree and uh, a, a cursed, a cursed death it was. The curse of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, Galatians 3.13. The law is a curse. Why? Isn't that, wasn't the law good? The law is good. It's the law of God. It tells you about how to live holy. But it was a curse because no one could keep it. So it meant that because they couldn't keep the law, they were cursed. So the law was like a curse. But then he has redeemed us from the curse, being made a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree this is something of the forsaking of the lord jesus christ on the cross this is his real agony it's not the pain in his body it's not the pain in his body that's the agony on the cross Though it was the most painful and, and terrible death, the pain was the forsaking of God, forsaking him because he was bearing sin, the sin of his people. He is the propitiation for our sins, John says. That means he is the sacrifice that takes away the wrath of God. How else can he be the propitiation for our sins if not by the father forsaking him and giving him over you can say well of course the, the father still loves him and no doubt when we suffer the lord loves us still also so this is the agony of the cross christ being forsaken but bearing sin now we read in verse 47, some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, this man calleth for Elias. They heard the word Eli, which means my God, my God. And they thought he was, because the words weren't full, 
they were calling for Elijah, Elias. Why do they do this? Simply, they don't know what's going on. But Jesus knew. And in this forsakenness, there's more to it. There's much, much more. And that's why we read and sang much in Psalm 22. Psalm uh, 22. Now here, Jesus just speaks from verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But that is like a title to the song. Well, it, 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 it has got a title above it, to the chief musician upon Ajales Shaha, or the deer of the morning. That, you know, that was the tune that they sung. The heart or the deer of the morning. Imagine the deer springing up to sing. Well, the deer in the morning, maybe that's a time for hunting the deer. I don't know, but the deer of the morning, it's a lovely sound to a, a tune. And there's more to it than just the forsaking. Though he announces the forsaking, God forsaking him as he says this psalm, there's much more here. And in the next few minutes, we'll just bring out some of this. In reciting on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is, is basically saying, Psalm 22, he's saying. Psalm 22. Now he's saying the words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he is forsaken, and they're very true words. But the whole psalm, the whole psalm, he's, he's referring to the whole psalm just in the one verse. We must remember that when we quote verses from the Bible. Look at the chapter. Don't just say one verse on its own. Consider the whole. <coughs> he is the one here. He's declaring himself to be the one that God is forsaking on the sacrifice of the cross. This is his work that he's come to do. Yes, it's a cry of dereliction, but it's part of the whole psalm. Go on in this psalm. I, and I was noticing as we were reading it, look how it goes into praise so quickly. In verse 3, thou art holy. He knows he's praying to the holy God. He hasn't done anything wrong. It's all the will of God. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. Great. He knows that he's trusting in the Lord that's forsaking him. And then we go on to verse 7 and 8. And we see how these things are fulfilled. They're being fulfilled at the time. This is the time. Verse 7 and 8. All they that... See me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. Seeing he delighted. You see, he delighted in it. This is just what happens in the Gospel of Matthew. I won't turn to the verses. The time, 20, Matthew 27. And in other places, they're mocking Christ on the cross, weren't they? And this is exactly what it says in here. It's happening. God's forsaking him. But it's not all unknown. The mocking is known too. And then in verse 16, well, we could go on, but there's more we could we could look at. Um, but just some of this. Verse 16, for dogs have come with me. Uh, the uh, dogs are those that are the, the ungodly. Dogs have come with me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. This is being fulfilled as well as the forsaken. They pierced his hands and feet. He's on the cross. He's being forsaken. But these verses are, 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 are here. Uh, this is what's happening. The whole of Psalm 22 is happening on the cross with the forsaken of Jesus Christ. And verse 18, we remember this from recently. We've been looking at these things. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. They cast lots. They, they divided 
the clothing, uh, they parted it, they divided the clothing, but the undergarment they cast lots for in one piece. Exactly what happened just at this time before Jesus Christ as he was crucified. Maybe he's just got like a, a, a tiny thing under, covering him underneath around the groin perhaps, but his, his, his one garment, his robe was taken and cast lots in one but the other garments were were divided exactly what happened this is the crucifixion of jesus christ they pierced his hands and his feet yes there he is on the cross the one forsaken by god this psalm written some thousand years before do we really consider this do we really consider that Jesus Christ crucified was prophesied a thousand years before? The one that was never ever forsaken by God and this is now happening and he uses these very words in his crucifixion. But there's, much, there's more and there's much more in Psalm 22. Did you notice that the last portion we sang was quite joyful? It brought out some great things. Now, if we've got time to just briefly consider this, verse 19 to 20, 21, we see there's more to the cross than the forsaking. There's more to it. Verse 19, but be not thou far from me, O Lord. Oh, he's been far, but he won't be far soon. Oh, my strength, hasty to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the... Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I don't believe in fairy tale unicorns, but something with one horn, something piercing. But from verse 22, we see this prayer answered. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. I thought you were dead. Ah, I'm going to declare, I'm going to declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation when I praise them. This is why we love to sing the Psalms. Christ leading the singing of the Psalms. He's going to be leading the singing in the midst of the congregation when I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. Come on. Why? How can we praise him? Well, because he's alive, isn't he? Yes, we come to this in a couple of days' time, God willing. And you see the seed, or ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, fear him, or ye the seed of Israel. For not, he had not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. He hasn't hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows. And it continues down here um verse 27 all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the lord and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before me for the kingdom is the lord's and he's the governor and uh, among all the nations all the nations even and all the gentiles and they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship and they that go down to the dust Verse 30, a seed shall serve him. There is a, a, a following on from Abraham. We know in Galatians, Christ is the seed of Abraham. And those that are in Christ are Abraham's seed. Uh, and it continues. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. That be declaring his righteousness to the crucified one. He shall be done that he hath done this. Well, the language perhaps isn't as clear as Psalm 16. Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell. Psalm 16. Verse 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Or in the grave, perhaps more accurately, we would think of this. Not more accurately, but the word meaning the grave. 
neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption and that's what we'll turn to god willing on the lord's day next but you see here then he knows the whole psalm by crying the first verse he sets forth here a most glorious future of his seed serving him from all nations so christ crucified being forsaken quoting psalm 22 he knows he feels it but the answer is in the psalm it's all there from the piercing of his bones from the dividing of his garments and the glory that shall come is seen that there is rejoicing in that psalm is very very plain and we cannot deny it he feels the agony but he knows the whole picture and the glory that will follow do we do you know the glory that will follow from faith in the crucified savior that this death is that bearing of sin for his people that it must be done that the offering must be done must be made but the offering is accepted and christ is risen from the dead well you're not meant to talk about the two the church of england by the way not all of them but most of them in their preaching good friday and easter sunday they separate the two they don't bring them together but they're always together the cross and the resurrection are part of the one part of the one the offering is accepted. The Lord is risen. The crucified Savior is risen. The one who bore sin is alive. And those that trust in him are alive and are risen from the dead. And you can't preach the one without the other. But they have the cross. Oh, the terrible part. And that's some, some solemn occasion. And then they have life. But there's no connection between the two and the gospel is destroyed there's no gospel without the cross and the resurrection being part of the same event the same offering of jesus christ yeah so then this was the time the only time that jesus was forsaken he'll never be forsaken again he's done that work it is finished as he cries out from the cross he knew what he was doing. He came. He said, I, let, I have power to lay my life down and I have power to take it up again. No one took it from him. He could have resisted. He could have got away, but he didn't. Though wicked hands slayed him, it was the determinate counsel of God, Acts 2. And so he gave himself. The father gave him. He gave himself, the spirit gave him, the father raised him up, he raised himself up, the spirit raised himself up from the dead. And because Christ was forsaken, he was forsaken in our place. He was forsaken in the place of his people. You may feel forsaken sometimes. You may think this is, I'm having a bad day. I'm having a bad. I'm having a bad. I'm having a bad year. I've got a bad life. You may think, but if you trust in the death of Jesus Christ for your sins, He said, "I will never leave thee nor forsake thee." He's done all the being forsaken, all the bearing of that darkness of wickedness of sin and evil christ has done it for us he never now forsake us his people it's done it's finished we don't go around wearing crosses and crucifixes because jesus is no longer on the cross he's alive he's reigning in glory and one day we'll see him meanwhile we set our hearts on things above where christ is we do go back and consider the cross we're always preaching christ crucified but at the same time we're always 
preaching Christ raised, Christ glorified, Christ no longer forsaken, Christ the King of glory, Christ the Saviour of all that come to him. This is the uh, something of the unsearchable riches of Christ. And why we can come back week after week to the wonders of what he did on the cross. Let us pray. And in prayer we'll apply this to our hearts especially. For our Father in heaven and our Lord Jesus Christ at thy right hand, our Saviour, our Mediator, our Advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous, O oh Lord, how many times have we forsaken thee? But not in a righteous way, not as part of thy offering of sin. We've forsaken thee, Lord, in thought and word and deed. We've, we've almost denied thee in some respects, not by our words perhaps, but by our lives, by our thoughts by our actions, and we're most unworthy. Lord, the thought of heaven would be a joke. We could never be fit for heaven. And yet what a wonder, what a wonder that the eternal Son of God, who always beheld thy face, who always beheld thee, was always in thy presence as we desire lord and we know we should be in thy presence as thy people with all thy blessings and yet he he gave himself to be a forsaken curse to be an offering for sin the offering for sin the blood of bulls and goats of all those old testament sacrifices could never take away sin, but Christ once, once and finished. And all those that trust upon him are saved from all that curse that was upon us. And he glorified Jesus Christ, risen. We joined together accepted in him because of him oh lord we praise thee for our savior we thank thee that what was the blackest of fridays is good friday what a great day oh lord we pray help us in all our agonies in all our woes our disappointments, heartaches, and especially as we're conscious of our sin and our unworthiness to be called thy sons. Oh Lord, help us to remember that Christ died for all our sin. All, all sin, once finished forever oh we pray be merciful to us we pray if we've never looked and considered that that man on that cross is our savior and our only hope that we may look to him now and worship him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.